<clears throat> okay, welcome back to the Spring Fever Garden Forums, and we saved the best for last. How about that, Jan? <laughs> no. But before we close it up for this spring, we got a few thank yous we need to say. First of all, thanks to the county agents out there. This uh, broadcast is being being the 30 county offices so thank you to the county agents and the master gardeners who are hosting this i hope all you gardeners out there appreciate the hard work and dedication of your county agent they open up their county office four nights for these programs and uh, we just just thank you to the county agents it's so wonderful also uh got to give my thanks to bob birch with ad communications you know, you just saw Bob at his finest a few moments ago. The system crashed, and then Bob just did a few clicks. In just a few moments, the system was going statewide again. So, Bob, you know, just uh, I, I really, this you are making such a huge difference in, through this program. We could not do this program without you, and you've been with us from the very beginning, and uh, just a great partner, and thank you for what you do. Also, I want to just give you a heads up that we, we need to evaluate our program. We, we strive to give you the best quality program we can. So the county agents, they did get an evaluation sheet. So we, would, we really would appreciate if we get your comments. Tell us what we're doing right. Tell us what we can improve. Um, again, we want to do whatever we can to make the Spring Fever Garden Forums. Uh, we just want to keep growing and it's growing strong now let's keep it going so uh if you can complete this and give it to your county agent tonight that's great if you're too busy you could uh, scan and email this to me if you want or you can mail it to my office the address is at the bottom of the second page or you know if you have registered or if you're online and not in a county office and you registered i will be sending an online evaluation form uh, you don't need to do both please just one or the other but um, we really would appreciate your comments for our program. So with that out of the way, let's get going to our last talk, and we're talking about butterflies. Butterflies, that's a, that's a fun critter. Everybody loves butterflies. And there's a lot of folklore surrounding butterflies. I know that in many cultures, a butterfly symbolizes a hope. And good fortune in the future because when you just think about it like what was a butterfly just a creepy ugly caterpillar and then before you know it it can transform itself into a majestic winged beautiful creature so there's always hope and another, I remember once when I was taking a, a walk in a garden and with another gardener and this butterfly was circling all over me and then landed on my shoulder and she told me that was an angel overlooking and, uh, and watching me. So I thought that was interesting. Another one, <laughs> it's kind of crazy, huh, Jan? You didn't hear this one. How about this one? In Taiwan, I lived in Taiwan for seven years. And the word for butterfly is very similar to the word for long life. And so, you know, I don't know, heck, I don't know if any of this folklore is true with butterflies, but... Everybody loves butterflies. Uh, their beautiful colors and delicate movements are just absolutely wonderful and enchanting. And it's here to tell us how to attract more butterflies to our landscape is Jan Canodal. She's an extension entomologist for NDSU. So Jan, welcome to the forums. Thank you, Tom. So we'll go ahead and get started with the PowerPoint and I hope that also that you have the butterfly gardening in North Dakota fact sheet uh, that was sent out. And co-authors with that was Esther McGinnis and Gerald Fowski. <clears throat> so just a little bit of history. Um, like Tom said, there is a lot of folklore uh, that goes along with butterflies. And you might wonder, where the name butterflies came from. Well, it originated in Britain. They had these beautiful yellow brimstone butterflies flying around early in the spring in the woodlands. 
So people refer to them as butter flying. And that's actually how the name butterfly uh, came about. Well, <laughs> it is in the insect group, and they do have the typical uh, three body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen, a pair of antennae, two pairs of wings, and a hardened exoskeleton. So, and butterflies in specific belong to the order Lepidoptera, and they're characterized by their scaly wings. And that's what we get from, from seeing those beautiful colors on the wings for butterflies. And some of the scales on the wings are, are tremendous number, about 125,000 per square inch. So that's quite a bit and you can get a lot of uh, different colors. And uh, some of the colors are related to the light being reflected as well. And sometimes you can even tell the age of a butterfly by looking at the scales on the wing. Um, as you know, the scales, when you pick up a butterfly with the by the wings, the scales will rub off easily. Well, we can kind of tell from how many scales are on the wing by how old the butterfly is. When it first emerged from the chrysalis, the scales are very pristine. And as it starts to age, the scales get rubbed off and duller in color. So butterflies um, are typically active during the day as well. Um, in the order Lepidoptera, we also have moths, but they're active in the evening. Just a little bit about the life cycle of a butterfly. It really varies species to species. Uh, some butterflies only have one generation a year, and other species um, will have multiple generations, like the monarch butterfly. And here we have the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. They have a complete metamorphosis or life cycle, so they have four different stages. The egg, larvae or caterpillar, pupae or chrysalis, and the adult. And the amount of time can vary too, uh, depending on the insect. But the pupae or the chrysalis, I should also mention, is more of a resting stage. So it's the non-feeding stage. So and then you get the adult butterfly emerging from that. And the caterpillars are the ones that do most of the feeding on different plants. We'll talk a little bit about the host plants. So there's a lot of different species of butterflies um, in the world. There's about 16,000 species. And of course, as you move down towards the tropics, uh, the rainforest, there's many more species. In North America, there's about 7,500 7, species. In North Dakota, we're cold here, <laughs> we have about only 161 species. But the main thing about a butterfly gardening is very similar to like planting a pollinator garden. The location, 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 very important. Uh, they love the hot, uh, sheltered uh, locations uh, to plant your flowers in. And also, um, if you don't have a sheltered spot, you can use fences, trellises, or br uh, brushes, or other trees to provide some protection. And also, the adult butterfly feeds on nectar sources from the flowers, but they also need water. So you can provide uh, feeders for them, like the one on the right. Uh, that one provides both nectar, and then you can also put pieces of fruit on top of it. And then also you can plant the different plants um, to attract butterflies. They feed on the nectar on flowers, or you can tr attract, use different plants for the caterpillars or larvae. Uh, and then we'll discuss those. But again, we don't recommend insecticide use. You may get some pests that come in on your flowers or plants um, for the caterpillars.
but in general, you know, we don't recommend using insecticides if you're trying to attract butterflies because most of the insecticides today are fairly specific to all insects and they will kill the butterflies. So when you're planting your flowers, you want to have a continuous um, blooming of different flowers to provide nectar. And these are just some of the examples for early summer flowering perennials that are good nectar sources for butterflies. Allium, chives, golden alexandrum, and pinks. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have time to show pictures of all the uh, beautiful flowers. And then here's some of the midsummer flowers. Uh, some of my favorite is black eyed Susan and catnip and phlox. Uh, Russian sage and sunflower is another one of my favorite. Actually, they all are. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, again, planting a diversity because different butterflies like different flowers. And then fall uh, flowering perennials. Uh, this is probably a place where a lot of people forget about the fall, um, but it's very important. Uh, for the monarch, for example, it's going to be doing its reverse migration south to Mexico, the overwintering grounds. And for other butterflies, they need to fatten up as well for the overwintering. Some of them do overwinter as adults in North Dakota. So the golden prods, aster, cedium, and sneezeweed are very important. And here's some annuals you can plant to fill in between those perennials. Uh, the butterflies and the pollinators, too, uh, really love these uh, annuals here. And these are all listed in the fact sheet. And we can't forget about the milkweeds. Uh, they're very important um, for the uh, larval caterpillar of the monarch butterfly. And there's several different species that can grow here in North Dakota. So if you have the heavier or drier soils, you can select the one that is most adapted uh, to your area. And I'd like to thank Esther for putting this table together. <clears throat> and then there's a lot of different uh, nectar sources that uh, vary depending on the butterfly, as I mentioned. And then this is just part of table four. Uh, the whole table is available in the fact sheet. Uh, but you can see which plants are attractive to different butterflies. So if you wanted to attract the black swallowtail, you know, you'd plant phlox, bee balm, sunflower, etc. So um, this can provide you with some guidelines if you have a favorite butterfly. And again, some of the flowers have been genetically modified through breeding and so forth to produce more petals. And this replaces some of the reproductive parts. So then that particular flower on the right um, doesn't have any nectar. So make sure you're buying flowers that do produce nectar for the butterflies. I mean, it's okay to plant a few plants with no nectar, but to a butterfly, you can never have enough flowers. <clears throat> and then there's always the caterpillars. That's a completely different um, looking from the butterflies. A lot of people don't recognize the uh, larvae or the caterpillars, but they also have different food sources. Um, so you may want to also plant some of the food sources of the uh, caterpillar as well as the nectar sources for the butterfly. And there's lots of different ways to identify butterflies. Uh, you will need a good pair of binoculars um, so you can see the butterflies. And basically, um, we can um, uh, use these bu butterflies through binoculars. The east and west are one of my favorites. They have beautiful color pictures. And a real inexpensive book is one of the golden guides. And there's a lot of other um, field guides out there uh, through Audubon, Kaufman, and so forth.
But there is a um, Butterflies of North Dakota book, so you may want to get a hold of that. It's uh, from a professor, retired now, uh, Dr. Royer from Minot State University. And he's uh, put together a beautiful book on the butterflies of North Dakota with several color pictures as well. And then you'll need a different set of books for identifying the caterpillars. So they do look completely different uh, from the butterflies, of course. So let's go through just some of the groups of the butterflies. These are the skippers, Hesperidae, and they kind of look um, like the evening setting sun. Hesper means evening sun, and the orange is referred to the setting of the sun. So they're a fairly small uh, butterfly, and there's about 42 species in North Dakota. And skipper refers to their erratic flight. And we do have the endangered species that's under the threatened status, the Dakota skipper um, in North Dakota. It's mainly out in the north central region. And we I helped out with some trapping for it. Um, when I was back in Minot near Garrison, and we did find it out there. But these are just some examples um, over on the lower right of some of the skippers we have in North Dakota. And for identification, besides the color and small size, you can look at the tenno club if you're up close enough. They're either hooked or it's twice as uh, long as wide. And they, in general, hold their antenna quite wide. If you look at the top picture on the right, you can see the base is fairly wide. Um, in other butterflies, it's more narrow and V-shaped. Then the larvae are pretty distinguished looking. They have a neck uh, behind the head. And they generally spin silken tubes with leaves or grasses, like the Dakota's skipper that one um, uses some um, little blue stem swallowtails this is probably one of the favorite of a lot of people the canadian tiger swallowtail in the black but they're quite large uh, butterflies uh, very um, uh, distinguished looking with their little tails on the hind wings and there's about nine species in North Dakota. And for the larvae, they have an interesting feature where they can evert uh, an organ on the head. It's called the osmeterium. And it's used as a defensive mechanism against predators that might be preying on it. And it also emits a fall order. And you can see the chrysalis, too, on the leaves. Uh, they're resting with their head up. Then we have the sulfurs and whites, uh, the purity. Uh, they can range in color and they have different spots on the wings. And of course, this is the one I mentioned earlier for the yellow color from, that created the word butterfly. There's about 14 different species um, in North Dakota. And this one you might be familiar with if you garden, because there's the imported cabbage worm, and that's the critter there on the caterpillar on the left that likes to get into your cabbage and chew holes. Uh, but they have kind of a minute hail, uh, hairs next to the uh, uh, body. And this one, too, the pupae or chrysalis rests with the head up. And then it has like a little silken string that supports it about the middle. Then there's the Glossoburn wing butterflies. And these are one of my favorites. They're the blues. And they're very beautiful or brightly colored, the wings. And on the hind wing, they do have the uh, tails as well. And another characteristic, which you probably won't see unless you get pretty close, is the eye actually touches the base of the antenna there. There's about 29 different species um, in North Dakota. And here's the same group, the coppers and the hair streaks and the summers are. 
And they, they're kind of an interesting group for the larvae or caterpillars because they're kind of slug-like. So they, it's more difficult to see a, a head area. Um, and then you'll see ants feeding along with them. And that's because the larvae excretes a honeydew and the ants feed on the honeydew. And then in turn, the ants provide protection for the larvae against predators. So it's a symbiotic relationship. And then we have the brush-footed butterflies, Nymphalidae, uh, which is um, our mo uh, monarch is in this group. But one of the main characteristic is you'll only see four legs when they're walking around on the flowers. And that's because the front pair of legs is actually reduced and it's used for tasting. And there's about 54 species in North Dakota. And we'll break this large group down into seven subgroups. And the larvae are very... Um, diverse but often a lot of them have spines on them and the chrysalis or the pupae hangs downward uh, from a cremister which is the point where it's attached <clears throat> and the first group is the fritillaries uh, they're medium and they're pretty much black and orange um, on the undersurface of the hind wing you'll see silver spots and you'll see with the the two on the left, you'll see the, the right part of the wing is detached from the body, and that's the underside of the wing. So on the left is the top surface, and on the right is the undersurface, and you can see the beautiful silver spots. And there's about 11 different species in North Dakota. Then we have the crescents or checker spots. Um, as well, they're black and orange, but they have a more solid black margin on the wing and the antenna spoon shaped. There's about eight different species. And then we have the angle wings or tortoise shelled uh, butterflies. And the morning cloak is in this uh, group. They're medium to large size. You can see the edge of the wing is kind of scallop shaped. Um, and rough. And if you look at the top surface, it's, it could be very colorful, but the underwing is uh, kind of mimics tree bark and leaves. And these are one of the only group of uh, butterflies that aren't really attracted to flowers for nectar, but they feed on tree sap, cloves, and fermenting fruit. And there's about 10 species. You will see them feeding on nectar, but they prefer the fruit and the sap. Here's some of the others. Again, you can see the uh, scalloping and the wing edge. And then the underside in the lower right, uh, that kind of looks like the bark of a tree or a leaf. And then we have the thistle butterflies. This is the painted lady, which migrates up in the red admiral. And they're medium with bright uh, colors, and they typically have eye spots on the ventral side of the hind wings. And there's four species. And then we have the ad admiral, admirals, uh, the viceroy and the white admiral. And they're pretty large with very colorful patterns, and they have a weak antenna club. And they like to fly, um, they're kind of circle with very flat wing glide. And there's only about three or four species in North Dakota. <clears throat> and then we got the milkweed butterflies, they're large again, and they have the typical orange wings with the black veins. Everybody knows the uh, monarch, I think. And they like to flap and then they follow that with a long glide. And then we do have mimicry with the viceroy and the monarch. Uh, the viceroy in the lower right is mimicking the monarch. And the reason why is it because it has defensive chemicals, the monarch, from feeding on the milkweed. 
so it makes it toxic to predators. So the viceroy is trying to mimic that so it's protected as well. And then we got the brush-footed butterflies. Um, they're medium size, and most of them are kind of dull colored, more like what you would expect with a moth. But they often have eye spots as well on the uh, wings. And one of my favorites is the common wood nymph. You can see that um, if you if you actually collect some, you'll see that the vein is very swollen at the base of the forewings. There's about 11 different species. And in the uh, fact sheet, you'll see a calendar that shows you when the different butterflies come in or occur in North Dakota. And some of them have, you know, more than one generation a year here. So they might come in June and then again in August. Uh, but most of them are most common is probably July is probably the month where you're most likely to see a majority of the butterflies. <clears throat> and that's all I have. And there's a picture of the fact sheet. If there's any okay, questions. Good. Great. What's, any questions out there for Jan? How about Jan, can you talk about where would be a good place in a landscape for a butterfly garden with sun or shade does that make a difference or should it be sheltered or not yeah they like the they uh, like the sun primarily in sheltered locations uh, but if you're just putting in a garden like i'm just putting in a one on the south side and i'm out in the open so i've planted some shrubs but it's going to be a while before they're large enough okay but yeah it's hot and sunny because the butterflies need fairly warm temperatures to fly. They need like 80 degrees. So you'll often see them sunning themselves on plants and trees. And, and that's because they're trying to warm up their body body temperature high enough so they can fly. So do you ever put out like some dark rocks for them to bathe on? Or? Yeah, they do like, that's another thing um, that was mentioned in the fact sheet is they do like the sun. So you can put out objects for them to land on in sun. Do you ever give them like a, a muddy water for salt? Yeah, they do like um, uh, mud because they do need minerals. So you can put out like a salt block that you typically use for livestock or, or just have an area that um, provides mud um, for them. But it's sometimes difficult to keep it wet. Yeah. How about um, what does the woolly bear caterpillar produce? Oh, that's a moth. <laughs> it's a um, Artean moth. It's called the Isabella tiger moth. So it's a beautiful uh, moth, actually. Uh, but... Do you believe that it can tell the <laughs> winter, predict winters? Yeah. No, know. that's kind of a folk yeah. folklore. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's an interesting one. Uh, I think the width of the band indicates the severity of the winter. Uh, they're brown and then they have the black band. So the wider the band, the worse, the more severe and colder our winter. Yeah, every winter is severe here. Yeah. So <laughs> it doesn't make a difference. No. How about uh, the issue about, you know, monarchs, they have to have milkweed, but milkweed's a uh, noxious weed some places you can grow the um, one that is cultivated the milkweed um, that was in the table uh, showy one yeah the showy one oh, and it's uh, an orange flower and that's a cultivated species that's not invasive right and I can't remember the scientific oh yeah yeah tuberosa okay. and it does you know good and medium to dry soil so I I have it in my garden and it's it's doing pretty good but they're very slow to come up in the spring so that's an ornamental milkweed yes like i think that showy milkweed is a, is a purple flower just like the common just yeah like this little, is an orange flower right yeah yeah so you can use the orange flowering milkweed yeah that's not noxious that's an ornament so it's beautiful right. and 
will help them on it. Yeah, the common milkweed is the one that's most invasive. The other ones, like the swamp milkweed, that requires a wet area, and it's not invasive at all if it's um, not, you know, a wet place. How about do any other butterflies have uh, uh, strategies to protect themselves with toxins? Besides the monarch, um, well, they they use that defense of the caterpillar has that defensive mechanism where it averts the uh, uh, structure. It kind of looks like a snake's tongue, hmm. and that's supposed to scare predators from eating the caterpillar. So <laughs> it'd be interesting. I haven't seen it myself, yeah. so. <laughs> Yeah, some of those caterpillars are a bit scary looking. Yeah, some of them have eye spots as well. Yeah. Um, oh, another defensive mechanism on the wings is the eye spots. Uh, they're supposed to look like uh, the eyes of a larger predator. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's a question about some good sheltered shrubs. Maybe you can just tell me which, which ones oh. are you planting? <laughs> well, they do, do like favorites? the ones with flowers, um, like lilac. Um, the lilac tree, um, I'm trying to think. We didn't have too much on the trees, I don't think, um, in the publication. But well, any, any of the flowering trees um, would work. Nine bark. How about uh, why do those uh, white moths always find a cabbage? Why do they eat cabbage? What's so good about cabbage? Yeah. Anyhow? <laughs> Many of the, um, if you look at the list for the um, caterpillars, you'll find they're fairly host specific and that's for, as their food source. So, you know, they'll go to all the brachiaceae plants in the garden, like your broccoli, um, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. And they have amazing abilities to sense the cabbage plants. They do, right? yeah. They can pick up that. Yeah, and they have, um, you know, they can smell. They have um, through their antenna, or there's pads on the feet that they can sense. So I didn't know monarchs eat with their feet. Yeah. <laughs> their front feet. <laughs> I didn't know that one. And they use it for cleaning their <laughs> eyes and antenna. <laughs> crazy. Um, how about, uh, uh, do you have some uh, tips on like annuals that produce the most nectar? Or, or Zinia is really good. Yeah, um, right. You have to have an open flower. Yeah, open. Habit. I like uh, Verbania. Um, oh, what's that? other one i really enjoyed i grew it last oh, they uh, love lantana them. oh they okay. love lantana um cosmos are good uh, some of the blanket flower yeah you it's know, really good you know i see jan here she's got uh <clears throat> lots of butterfly attractants for flowers in that university publication so you know shrubs you have lilacs spireas choke cherry oh, dogwoods okay. uh, perennials or flocks or coneflower and that's, this is in her slides too she had a lot of this too the butterfly weed we talked about mm -hmm. that's really an important one yeah and that one's not invasive at all that's the one that's not invasive um uh fermenting fruit is that attract Butterflies fermenting. Well, fruit. just the the group went with the like the morning clo clove oh, butterfly. Right? Just see. that one group. Um, so you could put it out uh, midsummer, but in the spring they're more attractive to the sap that's flowing from some of the trees. But we don't recommend wounding our trees. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no matter how much you love butterflies, you don't want to yeah. kill a tree over it. And one of the other things you can do is provide a box uh, for butterflies to go in for shelter. They make these uh, boxes oh, with narrow holes in them. I have one, but I haven't seen any butterflies using mm -hmm. it yet. So I'm kind of waiting to see if it's something that's very useful for a garden. How about uh, 
you, you ever see those butterfly feeders that you can buy yeah. along with the bird feeders? Mm -hmm. like, do they work, those butterfly feeders? or um, are they useful? They're, You're still better having lots and lots of flowers with nectar. Go um, natural. Huh? Yeah. Make but sure they... if you enjoy, like I really enjoy feeding the birds, and I do tend to put out uh, feeders for other animals too, mm -hmm. <laughs> like butterflies. Yeah. Uh, McLean County says they've had butterflies use uh, the boxes. Okay. It's worked in bad weather and wind. Mm hmm Okay. Any other questions about butterflies? So when you were a little girl, did you have a butterfly collection? Yes. That's did you really? Actually, how I got started. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> That's ants I liked. Oh, really? You're chasing after butterflies yeah. and nets and pinning them up? Wow. Well, <laughs> now, nowadays, you never know uh, some of the species are endangered, so. You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, you're better off using your camera. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> Taking pictures. It's more correct these days. Okay, there's in, there's no more questions. I, let's thank you, Jan, for that really well, colorful and wonderful way to end the Spring Theater Forums. Um, this, I noticed there's a question about the variety trial program. Yes, it's it's ongoing this year. You can go to the North Dakota Home Garden Variety Trials, and it's there. Um, and just, uh, we just want to thank everybody uh, for the forums. And this is not the end. You know, North Dakota State University, our extension service is there for you. We're there all summer. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to contact your local county agent and they are your best line of defense. They have the science-based answers that can help you. So uh, we hope to keep this partnership going all year round. With that, you know, again, we encourage you to complete your evaluation forms and we wish you all a wonderful summer, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.